Welcome to Michigan State University and congratulations on celebrating the 50th anniversary of the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Michigan enjoys a rich and creative history. Our creative industries have played a significant role in our communities, our schools, and our economy. The humanities shed light and provide context to moral questions of the day, feeding our curiosity and our search for learning. In September 1965, President Johnson signed the National Foundation on the Arts and Humanities Act into law. Through the work of the NEA and the NEH, Michigan's individuals and organizations have received grants to help them make lasting transformations to our state's cultural landscape. Again, congratulations on celebrating the NEA and NEH's 50th anniversary. Let's join together to make even greater strides over the next 50 years. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Dean of the College of Arts and Letters at Michigan State University, Christopher P. Long. Everyone. Welcome to Michigan State University and the Wharton Center for the Performing Arts. My name is Chris Long, and it is a pleasure, and it is a pleasure as Dean of the College of Arts and Letters to host this celebration of the 50th anniversary of the creation by Congress of the National Endowment of the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. This is a special night for the state of Michigan, which has a long and rich history of placing arts and culture at the center of public life. The National Foundation for the Arts and Humanities Act of 1965 that created the NEA and NEH reinforces what we in Michigan have long understood. Quote, democracy demands wisdom and vision in its citizens. It must therefore foster and support a form of education and access to the arts and the humanities designed to make people of all backgrounds and whatever, wherever located masters of their technology and not its unthinking servants." End quote. In an era in which we have never been more connected, deep, meaningful relationships have never been more difficult to establish. At a time when we have never been, had more access to information, real wisdom, the kind of wisdom democracy demands, remains elusive. The act of Congress that created the NEA and NEH recognized that in a period of rapid technological development, the flourishing of our nation depends upon our willingness to support the arts and humanities by placing them at the center of the education of our citizens. The arts and humanities empower individuals to think critically, imagine creatively, and respond ethically to the most challenging social, cultural, and political questions of our time. Their power lies not only in the creativity and discovery and innovation they enable, but also in the ways they cultivate a deep holistic understanding of the complex world we share. The federally funded grants the NEA and NEH provide have had a lasting impact on the lives of the citizens of the United States and of the state of Michigan in particular. As Dean of the College of Arts and Letters at Michigan State, I'm reminded daily of the transformative power of an arts and humanities education, access to which is fundamental to our land-grant mission. The arts and humanities informed the design of the Michigan State campus, and they continue to be at the core of our curriculum and to animate our ongoing efforts through community outreach and study away programs to expose our students to a wide diversity of perspectives. So what we've come together tonight to celebrate is not only the founding act that created the NEA and the NEH, but more importantly, the lasting impact of the work these two important institutions have empowered us as citizens to undertake. As a nation, we are more creative, 
more innovative, and more ethically attuned to the grand challenges of our time than we could ever have been without the NEA and NEH. And as a state, we in Michigan are better able to respond with vision and, yes, with wisdom to the intractable social, environmental, and ethical issues we face. With this in mind, let us congratulate the NEA and NEH on their 50th anniversaries, even as we wish them a bright and promising future. So let's give them a round of applause. <clears throat> now I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's MC, Nathan Triplett, the mayor of the city of East Lansing. Mayor Triplett was first elected to the East Lansing City Council in 2007. He is also the president of the Michigan Municipal League and is a member of the Capital Area Transportation Authority, CADA, and LEAP, the Lansing Economic Area Partnership. Nathan is a past president of the Rotary Club of East Lansing and is recipient of the Governor's Service Award and the MSU Distinguished Young Alumni Award. It is fitting that Mayor Triplett serves as our MC this evening as it reinforces the rich and enduring relationships between East Lansing and Michigan State University. In 2014, he was recipient of the inaugural Civic Leadership Award from the Arts Council of Greater Lansing, and he championed a percent for art public art requirement ordinance, making East Lansing the only municipality in Michigan with such a program for public and private developments. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming tonight's MC to Wharton Center Stage, Mayor of East Lansing, Nathan Triplett. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening to mark this momentous occasion, the 50th anniversary of two institutions that have had a transformative impact on our country, on the state of Michigan, and right here in the city of East Lansing. To begin this evening's program, we're going to be hearing from Barry Berge. Barry joined the NEA in 1985 as a senior arts specialist after having served as the state folk arts coordinator in the state of Missouri. In 2001, he became the director of folk and traditional arts at the NEA. In addition to overseeing the NEA's grant making in this area, Berge also manages the National Heritage Fellowships, the nation's highest honor for artists working in the folk and traditional arts, and provides ongoing counsel to the U.S. Department of State in international cultural policy issues. In addition, Berge has served as a field worker, festival organizer, radio producer, curator, and arts administrator. In short, Barry has pretty much done it all. So please put your hands together and help me welcome our first presenter this evening, Barry Berge. Well, thank you. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here and to speak about folk and traditional arts and the National Endowment for the Arts. I was at a meeting in, in California last week with uh, Kurt Dewhurst and Marsha McDowell, and we were talking a little bit. They're the guiding lights of the Michigan uh, Traditional Arts Program, and we were talking a little bit about uh, uh, this Friday and about the NEA and its role in traditional arts. and. Marcia mentioned that uh, the, their program has received over the course of uh, a number of years, about 40 years, uh, 60 grants from the NEA. And she described those grants as transformative. And I've heard that word several times already this evening, but I think that's a good word for what happens with NEA funding, or at least that's what we hope will happen. And I can speak a bit from personal experience because while Kurt and Marsha were developing a program here in Michigan in the mid-1970s, uh, a group of us uh, a little bit to the south in Missouri were doing the same thing. And we had an idea that there were lots of artists in, in Missouri and the Ozarks in that region that were not being recognized, appreciated, or for that matter, heard. And we thought that we'd just like to do a little bit of field work, a little bit of recording. Uh, we'd like to put out an album if we could just to draw attention to it. We don't really know how to do that. 
At the time, there wasn't a folk arts program at the state level. In fact, there wasn't even a folk arts program at the NEA. But I did know there was one person who was working at NEA who was a folklorist and who had some experience with uh, old time music. So I decided to go out and to visit him to see whether it might be possible to get a little money. And uh, I was greeted in Washington with an open door and a friendly face and some encouragement. And so we applied to the NEA. And lo and behold, much to our surprise, we got a grand total of $4,500 to do the work. And we thought that was big money then. And it was not so much the money that mattered to us, but it was that someone in Washington really cared about what we were doing and encouraged us to continue it. And that meant all the world to us. And it evolved into a program that involved festivals and other activities. But more than anything else, that changed my life. Now, the histories of NEA and the Michigan Traditional Arts Program are inextricably uh, entwined, really. Michigan Traditional Arts is one of the earliest statewide folk arts programs, and it continues to be a national model. It fulfills what I consider to be the four cornerstones of an effective cultural heritage program, cultural discovery, cultural democracy, cultural development, and cultural diplomacy. Let me speak about each of these for just a minute. Cultural discovery constitutes the ongoing fieldwork that identifies artistic resources in a state or region. Fieldwork and research were initiated at the very inception of the Michigan program in 1975 and led to its first public program, an exhibition of folk art. To this day, serious research and fieldwork, or what I like to call cultural discovery, inform the public programming at Michigan Traditional Arts. Cultural democracy addresses the ever-evolving and diverse expressive life of our nation. This approach is manifest in such programs as the Great Lakes Folk Festival, a free festival here that presents in the to the general public the depth and range of the region's community-based artistic traditions. I had the pleasure of attending the first model for that festival. It was called Michigan Whose Story? Question mark. And indeed, the Great Lakes Folk Festival, following its run as a national folk festival, has become an ongoing story of the state's vibrant and diverse artistic traditions. Cultural development fulfills the potential for traditional arts to inform our sense of ourselves and to assure that living traditions can be maintained. Through the Michigan Arts and Education Program, known as Folk Patterns, a collaboration with the 4-H and Cooperative Extension Service initiated in 1977, young people have been exposed to the theory and practice of folk arts. Through the Traditional Arts Apprenticeship Program, master artists have taught the knowledge and skills of the traditional arts. By my calculation, well over 200 apprenticeships in traditional arts have been carried out by the Michigan program. Finally, the opportunity for cultural diplomacy. Through collaborative programs in China and South Africa, the Michigan program has carried out exchanges of ideas and the sharing of artistic work. Most recently, the beautiful Chinese quilt exhibit on view at the MSU Museum. How then was all this possible? I mentioned that there was no program at the NEA for folk arts when I went there in 1974. Well, in 1977, Bess Lomax Hawes, a member of the legendary Lomax family, came to the NEA and she developed a program. And it led to the establishment of an infrastructure of statewide folk arts programs, the development of state folk arts apprenticeship programs, and funding support for public folk programs such as exhibitions, festivals, and media presentations. In 1982, she initiated the National Heritage Fellowship Program. This is the highest form of federal recognition of folk artists. 
I have to say that the best week of my year as director of the Folk Arts Program at NEA was when I got to call those artists and let them know that they had gotten a National Heritage Fellowship. My colleague Dan Sheehy told a story once of calling Johnny Gimbel, a fiddler from Texas, to tell him he got a National Heritage Fellowship, and he said, and by the way, Johnny, there's a, a $10,000 award that comes with the fellowship. And there was a quite a long silence on the phone, and finally Johnny said, well, tell me just one thing. He says, uh, do I have to pay it back all at one time, or can I pay back in installments? Um, but that's the pleasure of letting people know that good news. Approaching its 35th anniversary, that is the National Heritage Fellowships, Michigan artists have been honored in each of the four decades of the program's existence. I believe we can learn something about cultural value and the characteristics and the character of master traditional artists in taking a look at these Michigan artists. Artistic excellence is a thread that binds all of the artists who have become National Heritage Fellows. In the, in the interest of time, I'm going to just speak about a a few of them. The first recipient from Michigan was Wade Maynard from Flint. That was in 1987. He was born in North Carolina. He grew up around Appalachian musicians and began playing banjos and string bands. Between 1935 and 1941, he and his brother J.E., sometimes together and sometimes in separate bands, recorded over 165 songs for the RCA Victor label and made numerous appearances on local radio stations. Those became seminal recordings in old-time music history, predating what we now know as bluegrass music. In 1953, Maynard moved to Flint to work in the GM plant and continued to play music, but only among family and friends. But in the 1970s, with the revival of interest in folk music, his work was rediscovered, and he was featured on new recordings and made appearances at public festivals. Wade Maynard's story is one both of excellence and cultural continuity. In fact, in 2007, I traveled to Flint to attend his 100th birthday celebration, where he and his wife performed for a large crowd of admirers and friends. Howard Armstrong, a 1990 Heritage Fellow, provides a lesson in cultural creativity. Like Wade Maynard, Armstrong was born in a rural setting in the Mid-South in Tennessee. He was performing in string bands and by his, mid, by his mid-teens, and he was traveling around Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky, entertaining miners and steel workers. But during World War II, he moved north to Detroit to work in the auto plants. But he continued to adapt his African-American musical roots to suit audiences of the various urban ethnic groups that had settled in Detroit and Chicago. Eventually, he was able to sing and communicate in eight languages. In addition, he expressed himself through the visual arts, painting, creating what today we would call graphic novels, and even designing the juke joint used in the movie The Color Purple. Another recipient was Art Moylanen of Mass City, Michigan. Art's parents came to the UP from northern Finland, as did so many immigrants in the late 19th and early 20th century, to work in the copper mines. Moylanen took up the accordion in his youth. Although he worked as a logger, he played for dances and family gatherings. When he retired for logging, he purchased a bar in Mass City and continued to play his music. Mr. Moylanen, throughout his lifetime, provided the social soundtrack for the community of Finnish Americans in the UP. His is a lesson in the value of cultural community. Continuity, creativity, and community, all attributes that define the National Heritage Fellowship Program. Fortunately for us and for you, we're privileged to have two National Heritage Fellows with us this evening who can speak much better about this than can I. The first is Yvonne Walker Kishik of Petoskey, Michigan. She is the most recent Michigan recipient, and that would be have been in 19, I'm sorry, 2014. 
She's an Odawa quill worker, quill worker of extraordinary ability and creativity. Sent away from her family to a residential school, they attempted to eliminate Odawa traditions and language. She recovered the tradition of quill work as a result of her involvement with an arts and crafts cooperative in 1969 as part of the War on Poverty program. That's an early example of how some federal support can serve traditional arts. Yvonne came to Washington last year and spoke about and demonstrated her beautiful porcupine quill work. Now there's a lot of talk in Washington about pork, but very little about porcupines, as I, best I can tell. But she certainly impressed us with her stories about her quill work and her basketry and what it takes to get a porcupine to release its quills. So please make her welcome, Yvonne Walker Kishik. Thank you, Ani. Um, picture this. Two porcupines are in the woods, and they're staring at an Indian village, and there's a man sitting on the ground near the fire, and he's making a black ash basket. The first porcupine says to the other one, geez, I hope they don't invent quill work. <laughs> Nobody knows for sure how long quill work has been done in this country. Um, for thousands of years, Native people have been using the hairs of a porcupine quill, uh, porcupine to decorate boxes. And since we didn't have a written language, the boxes they made out of birch bark had a picture on top of what was inside the box. It might be dried fish, might be dried deer meat, might be uh, seeds, uh, dried grapes, could be, have been anything, could have been uh, medicines in there, but our original quill boxes were used for storing foods, seeds, herbs, medicines, clothing, um, tools, arrowheads, anything you could get inside of these containers. So maybe a thousand years ago or more, um, someone started using quill, the quills from uh, the porcupine and uh, I like to tell this other story where the, uh, the man comes home with a, with a porcupine and he puts it on the ground next to the lodge and then he wants his woman to, to clean it and cook it, which she does. And this happens often because a porcupine is easy to kill in the wild. To this day, there is no um, no law that protects a porcupine. It's open season on him any time. So after this man brings all these porcupines home and leaves, leaves it on the side of the lodge, and the woman cleans it and cooks it, one day he comes home and he's annoyed, and he says, and do something with these quills, and he's pointing at the quills all on the ground. So I believe a woman used the quills to invent uh, the decorations on the quill boxes. I also believe that quill boxes were invented before or after, shortly after the black ash baskets because the birch bark baskets fit inside the, the black ash baskets as a storage unit. So when I got the award, I was very surprised. Um, all my life, you know, I had, been learned, I had been taught to be diligent, to work hard, to do my best. And uh, it was the upbringing from the Catholic boarding school that instilled that in me. But what the boarding school took away was my ability to make decisions. I couldn't say no. I couldn't uh, speak because we weren't allowed to speak in school. And then, so that handicapped me when I went to public school. I was an individual, like a fish out of water, a social misfit, and by four years of high school were the, were the uh, loneliest years of my life when they're supposed to be the happiest for young people. So by learning how to do quill work, 
my teacher was Susan Shaganebi, and I was extremely shy. Um, I was highly disciplined. Uh, everything she taught me, she, uh, she was very patient, very kind. Um, I like to tease my students and tell them, you know, that they're going to learn how to do quilt work, you know, and if they don't, I'm going to hit them with a stick. <laughs> but my teacher was never like that, and I'm not like that with my, my students. But she told me often, many times, that one of her biggest fears was that when she walked on, the art of quill work was going to be gone, because there were so few young people getting interested in the quill work. So I, uh, I kept hearing that from her during the six years I worked with her, and every time I heard her say that, I thought, not as long as I'm alive. So I fell in love with doing quill work. Um, I used to do bead work, but when I learned how to do quill work, I gave them my, my beads, my leathers, and, and the other things I was working with, and did nothing but quill work. I studied the animal, did a, did a term paper on him, and uh, did the best I could, you know, to um, get over my shyness. And she told me that someday people are going to come to you and they're going to want to know. They're going to ask you questions, you know, because they want to know what you know. You're going to be an expert. And I didn't believe her. I just kept on working. When I realized what a good teacher she was, by then she had passed on. But I know that during the thousands of years that Native people have been doing quill cool work, there have always been teachers there to teach another person how to do the art form. People call it quill cool work. I call it therapy. It's good for me. It's good for the tribe. It's good for the culture. It's one of the best things we have, because without the good things in our culture, then we wouldn't survive. So on behalf of the uh, all the teachers who went on before me, um, I want to thank National Endowment for the award. Um, one of the other things that I would like to do is thank all those teachers that went ahead of me. They, didn't, they, they worked one-on-one -on -one and taught people. And it's always the future is in our young people. So what the award did was made me proud of myself, made me proud of my tribe, made me really proud of my teacher because she's not here to see, you know, the, what her work and efforts have brought about. So my teacher's name, I give credit to her. Her name was Susan Shaganabe. Uh, she was a full-blood Odawa woman from Harbor Springs. And uh, her being the good teacher, taught me how to be a good teacher. And so the award gives me an opportunity to teach more. I have been given many requests to go to schools, to do presentations, to talk to people, and um, to share what I know. Some people think it's, some of my tribal members think it's a mistake saying that you're, you're selling the farm, but I believe that power is sharing knowledge. It's not keeping it within myself, you know, for myself or for the, f the few people of my family. I teach whoever I can, tell them about it, and if they want to learn, I am willing to share that. So um, to all the teachers, I say thank you, Chimiguach, and I will continue on to do the best I can and to keep this art form going. People call it work, quill work. To me, it's, it's uh, something I love to do. And my son relabeled it as quill art, not quill work. So uh, all of you people out there listening, if you want to learn quill work, I'm in Michigan. <laughs> uh, I do a workshop once a year uh, at Three Pines Studio in Cross Village, and the people come and take the class. And by the time they're done, at the end of the week, they have a three-inch quill box made. So with the monies that I got from the Heritage Award, you know, um, I plan on writing a, and finishing a book. I wrote it in 1973, a step-by-step -step how to do porcupine quill work. And with, 
with this award money, I am finally going to get it published. Um, thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. That's what it's all about, is sharing. Uh, the 2002 Heritage Fellow from Michigan is Nadim Dlykin. He comes from Southgate. He was born in Lebanon. He studied the reed flute. Now, his parents thought that that was an instrument for shepherds and didn't necessarily encourage him to take it up, but he did and became a master. In 1969, he played for a Fourth of July celebration at the U.S. Embassy, and this led to an invitation for him to perform in the U.S. He eventually uh, relocated uh, in the U.S., in Southgate, and he's been sort of the cultural glue that has held the uh, large Arab community together in, in that area. I'll never forget that uh, Nadim, when I called him about the uh, award, he was a little bit concerned about flying. It was just uh, less than a year after 9-11, and he was a little bit concerned about getting on a plane and, and coming out here. But I encouraged him to come. And when he and his fellow musicians uh, showed up, they were smiling and happy and everything seemed to be okay. And then I noticed they were all three wearing very wide American flag ties. I think that had something to do with it. But uh, Nadim was a wonderful ambassador for the music and a healing force really at that event in 2002. So please make him welcome 2002 National Heritage Fellow, fellow Nadim Dlykan. Good evening. Before we start, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, my friend here uh, on the keyboard, Mr. Adnan Harakati. He's uh, from Tunisia. And uh, my right here, Mr. Mustafa Atad. He's from Lebanon. He played a uh, percussion. And uh, my name is Nadim Dalaikan.
Thank you. Can you all please uh, join me in acknowledging the wonderful performances and remarks that we've already had from Yvonne and Nadine, please. Round of applause. It also seems only appropriate, since we're on the topic of folk and traditional arts and the work of the NEA, that we take a, a brief second to acknowledge Kurt Dewurst and Marcia McDowell, the co-directors of the Great Lakes Festival, whose energy and support of an intrepid staff and volunteer cadre every year brings the Great Lakes Folk Festival to life in downtown East Lansing. So could you give me a round of applause as well for Kurt Dewurst and Marcia McDowell? So next we're going to hear a video testimonial from someone who needs no introduction to many of you from across our region, Craig Mitchell Smith, whose beautiful glass and metal sculptures lighten up corners across our region. So let's hear from Craig. I'm Craig Mitchell Smith. I'm a glass artist in Lansing, Michigan. I've been making glass since 2006. Uh, how my artistic career began, I'd made nothing you know, larger than coasters and some jewelry. And uh, suddenly I borrowed the money for um, a kiln and I just started making glass in a way that felt totally natural to me. And I was having some success. And then of course in 2008 the economy just collapsed. And I think I went 102 days without a single sale. I was very discouraged. I thought, oh, that, well, that was what a run you had. You'll always remember that. I think I'll go be a waiter in Portland, Oregon. Just as I was ready to give up, I received a notification that the Arts Council of Greater Lansing was starting a program they called the Individual Artist uh, Awards. And uh, with a lot of help from the wonderful people at the Arts Council, I received the first Individual Arts Grant, uh, partially funded through the NEA. I took that $1,000 grant and I spent every dime of it opening a wholesale account and getting as much glass as I could. I decided to do an exhibition of my work for Lansing's Cooley Gardens. Much to my surprise, I had a sellout show. It was a turning point where I thought, wow, with that little help to produce the show, to show what I could do, then that individual show turned into another show in Midland, Michigan, and then a show at Michigan State University. And Disney called and I suddenly did a whole field of poppies. Then that turned into the next year doing the entrance to Epcot Center. And now I'm going to Sri Lanka and teaching my method there. So this whole exciting and exhausting role started from the seed money that came from the NEA. I guarantee you, if that had not happened, I would say, how would you like your steak cooked, sir? Craig Mitchell Smith's testimonial reminds us of the impact that the NEA and NEH have had on our local community. But it's also important that we take a moment this evening to recognize the work that these important agencies have done in making art and humanities accessible to everyone. And to that end, we're privileged this evening to be joined by Beth Bienvenu, the Accessibility uh, Director at the National Endowments for the Arts. In that role, Beth manages the NEA's technical assistance and advocacy work, devoted to making the arts accessible for people with disabilities, older adults, veterans, and people in institutional settings. She provides guidance and support to state arts agency staff and professionals working in the fields of art access, creativity, aging and the arts, and health, universal design, and also arts in the correctional setting. So please join me in welcoming Beth to the stage. Thank you so much, Nathan, um, and thank you everyone for coming tonight. I'm honored to be here at the Wharton Center representing the National Endowment for the Arts at this amazing event. When I first heard, uh, when I first heard about this event, I was thrilled to hear that my home state was honoring the work of the NEA and the NEH. I am proud to work for the NEA because of its impact on individuals and communities across the country. Since its inception, the NEA has awarded $5 billion to every state and territory and every congressional district. Every year, we serve 4,500 communities through our grants, and 40% of our budget goes to the state and regional arts organization, uh, such as the Michigan Arts Council, which helps ensure that our funds represent the interests of communities across the country. 
So I grew up in Michigan, just seven miles down the road in Hazlitt. Throughout my time in the Hazlitt schools, I was fully engaged in the arts. I participated in the band, choir, and theater programs, and also took piano lessons. I believe it was my arts education that made me successful in school, kept me engaged, and led to a lifelong passion for the arts. Like all kids, I suffered from insecurities. My main issue was that I stuttered, which prevented me from getting parts in high school musicals, but, which was disappointing, but I found my, my way on stage and sang robustly in the choruses of those musicals. I sang in the, in the school choirs under Mary Alice Stalick, who later went on to lead the Michigan State Children's Choir. We traveled to Rome and Chicago, and we even sang here on this stage a few times. So at, I also played in piano recitals and performed, performed with the concert band and the marching band. And as a side note, I have to mention that my dream was to play in the Michigan State drum line, but my academic interests led me to a small college experience up the road at Alma College, where I also sang in the choirs, performed in Gilbert and Sullivan operettas, and even learned to do, the, to do Highland dance. But, and I also don't want to forget to mention my summers at Blue Lake Fine Arts Camp, which is another wonderful Michigan institution. So all of this is to say that everything I did in the arts growing up in Michigan gave me confidence and self-esteem and provided a home for me with friends and positive successes. And yes, I do believe that it was my experience on stage that helped me gain confidence and manage my speech. Yes, I still stutter. I did a little bit already. But I have no fear of speaking before what appears to be a pretty large crowd. So that's my Michigan story. And I tell it not only to sing the praises of my arts education experience here, but also to show you how valuable the arts are and how much I value the work that the NEA does. My job at the NEA, as Nathan said, is to help the arts reach people in communities who may not have access to the arts and all of its benefits. I help arts organizations to serve the underserved by helping them understand how to make their programs and facilities accessible to people with disabilities so they can fully participate in what they have to offer. I also support initiatives to bring arts programs to older adults and those with dementia and can, uh, can also improve their quality of life, their cognitive functioning, and their physical health. I help provide programs in correctional facilities, which has been shown to aid in rehabilitation, improve safety and security within prisons, and also reduce the risk of reoffending. And I help artists with disabilities overcome barriers to careers in the arts. So this work is rewarding because I know that I'm helping people and communities across the country gain the benefits of the arts, the intrinsic benefits, as well as the very tangible economic, health, cognitive, and educational benefits. So I thank my music teachers, my music directors, my parents, and my time in Michigan for stilling in me the love for the arts, the confidence to excel, and my interest in the work for the NEA. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Now we're in for a special treat. The National Endowment for the Arts and the Poetry Foundation have partnered with US state's arts agencies to support Poetry Out Loud, a contest that encourages our nation's youth to learn about great poetry through memorization and recitation. The program helps students to master public speaking skills, build self-confidence, and learn about their literary heritage. After successful program pilots in Washington, DC, and Chicago, Poetry Out Loud was launched in high schools nationwide in the spring of 2006 and has now grown to involve literally millions of students across our country. Our next guest, Coral Brantley, was Michigan's 2015 Poetry Out Loud state champion. Coral is a junior at Petoskey High School who is involved in drama, band, robotics, and young life. She is a longtime poetry enthusiast and has been writing and reciting poetry since she was introduced to it over a decade ago. The NEA and NEH have given her an outlet for her love of poetry, and she's looking forward to participating in Poetry Out Loud again this year. Please join me in welcoming Coral to the stage. I am, and always have been, a poetry enthusiast. I'm also a lot of other things as he just said, like an inspiring scientist and a musician. And my love of poetry often unfortunately takes a back seat to those things, simply because I don't have time to pursue it. 
The last couple years have changed that. The first time I competed in Poetry Out Loud, I was knocked out in the first round of my school competition. But I'd gotten a taste, and I wasn't about to back down. Last year, I won states and made it all the way to the last round of regionals at the national competition. Competing gave me a rush, but the real excitement for me was having an outlet for a longtime passion and being able to meet other kids with the same love. I don't think there was one person in either competition who wasn't told how great they sounded by the other contestants. And that was extraordinary to me, especially since the competition had such high stakes. I think, though, that this phenomenon can be explained rather simply. We were all there because we loved what we were doing. And we all found pleasure in being with such a diverse group that nevertheless was connected by a common thread. I want to express my sincerest thanks to the NEA for providing this wonderful opportunity for expression and connection. Um, I'm going to recite um, one of my poems that I did for both competitions. And this poem is one of my favorites. It's not my longest one or my shortest one. And it's not my most complex, but it's one of the ones that I just love. And it's honestly the reason that I keep writing and reciting. Song for the Last Act by Louise Bogan. Now that I have your face by heart, I look less at its features than its darkening frame, where quince and melon, yellow as young flame, lie with quilled dahlias in the shepherd's crook. Beyond a garden, there in insolent ease, the lead and marble figures watch the show of yet another summer, loath to go although the scythes hang in the apple trees. Now that I have your face by heart, I look. Now that I have your voice by heart, I read in the black chords upon a dulling page music that is not meant for music's cage, whose emblems mix with words that shake and bleed. The staves are shuttled over with a stark, unprinted silence. In a double dream, I must spell out the storm, the running stream, the beats too swift, the notes shift in the dark. Now that I have your voice by heart, I read. Now that I have your heart by heart, I see the wharves with their great ships and architraves, the rigging and the cargo, and the slaves on a strange beach under a broken sky. Oh, not departure, but a voyage done. The bales stand on the stone. The anchor weeps its red rust downward, and the long vine creeps beside the salt herb in the lengthening sun. Now that I have your heart by heart, I see. Thank you. Humanities are the way humanities are the way we connect to each other, any way we use to express ourselves. To me, the humanities mean an opportunity to make a difference. It's a way for people to have an elevated sense in their lives. The state humanities councils have had a major role in American culture in keeping the humanities alive. Having the humanities in the communities is something that changes for the better. Michigan Humanities Council provides us with the great catalog of experiences. 
they are working extremely hard to bring some unity to a state around the story of the state of Michigan. A different outlook on humanity and how we act as a community. There are tremendous possibilities for the humanities to be used to draw the uh, a community together. I think one of the greatest things about the Michigan Humanities Council is that they're so inclusive. We need organizations like the Humanities Council to help us know our own history because we use stories to tell our history and we connect with each other through stories that we both inherit and that we tell to each other. He is about to act upon a different set of scientific principles. He is ready to dance. The Michigan Humanities Council has really just opened my eyes to brighter things. I know that they're going to continue to change lives and reach out for the better. We've heard a little bit this evening about the impact of the National Endowment for the Arts. And as you've noticed from the video, now it's time to transition to hear about the National Endowment for the Humanities. And to begin this portion of our program, we have the distinct privilege of welcoming Peggy Plimpton, the Deputy Chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Before joining the endowment in January of 2015, Peggy worked at an executive search firm, where as a consultant in the company's higher education and not-for-profit practice, she supported nationwide searches for a range of positions in higher education including university chancellors, provosts, deans, and vice presidents. She also served for 13 years as the vice president for finance and administration at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and has held positions at Yale University, Wellesley College, and Harvard University. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Peggy Plimpton. Thank you very much for being here and being part of such a wonderful celebration of this 50th anniversary. I'm so glad to be able to join you and to be representing the National Endowment for the Humanities and bringing greetings from our chair, William Bro Adams, who's disappointed not to be able to attend himself. I'd like to start this evening by talking a bit about the founding of the agency and some of the themes that have been important to NEH throughout our 50 years. I'll next particularly focus on our work with Michigan and then move into a more future-oriented wrap-up. As you've heard, the enabling legislation for the National Foundation for the Arts and Humanities was signed into existence by President Lyndon Johnson in September 1965. This legislation includes the statement, the arts and humanities belong to all the people of the United States. This commitment has been central to our work ever since and continues today. We were created as a federally funded independent grant making organization and continue to function in that way. Since our founding, we have made more than 63,000 grants, totaling $5.3 billion, and also leveraging an additional $2.5 billion in privately funded matching grants. NEH grants typically go to cultural institutions, such as museums, archives, libraries, colleges, universities, public television and radio stations, as well as in support of individual scholars. Each year, we convene more than 1,000 independent experts on hundreds of external review panels in a wide variety of fields. These panels rate the applications that have been submitted, which are then reviewed by our staff and forwarded to the National Council on the Humanities, our advisory body, which meets three times a year to review these recommended applications. As a federal agency, we of course are very attentive to ensuring that our support through our multiple grant programs is distributed as widely as possible in order to bring the humanities to all Americans where they are. Having said that though, our funding is relatively small compared to the enormous variety of important humanities activities that are happening nationally. As such, our funding often functions as a signal for the excellence of individual projects, even when we can't fund the entire cost, which then enables grant recipients to garner additional support from other private funding sources. 
Mindful of this importance of, of bringing the humanities to all Americans, our focus now is particularly on the chairman's initiative, The Common Good, Humanities in the Public Square. This theme is best captured in some of the new grant programs we have put in place, including, for example, the Public Scholar Program, through which we award fellowships to humanities scholars whose work is intended for the general public or the Common Heritage Grants, which are awarded to cultural institutions in local communities throughout the United States to help them capture and preserve their local heritage for future generations. The grants we award through our more than 30 grant programs also serve to, for example, strengthen teaching and learning in schools and colleges, such as through teacher workshops on America's Industrial Revolution at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, or to facilitate research and original scholarship, such as the recent public scholar grant to Mark Clegg at the University of Michigan to write a cultural history of the Star Spangled Banner. To preserve and provide access to cultural and educational resources, such as the grant to the Keweenaw Bay Ojibwa Community College to collect and preserve oral histories from the elders of the Keweenaw Bay Indian community, and to strengthen the institutional base of the humanities, such as our support for the Marquette County History Museum to open a new facility downtown with children's classrooms, artifact storage, and exhibit areas. That gives you a sense of some of our recent activities. Let me now spend a few minutes on some particular highlights of the past 50 years of our grant making. For example, NEH played a significant role in changing the standards of documentary filmmaking, all the way back to our support for Ken Burns' first documentary film about the Brooklyn Bridge and his Civil War film 25 years ago, as well as many of his films since then. Overall, we've supported over 1,900 TV, radio, and film documentaries. We've supported blockbuster museum exhibits, starting with the King Tut exhibit, which traveled in 1977 around the United States and was seen by over six million visitors. And we have worked and continue to work to provide public access to Chronicling America, the website through which 10 million pages of digitized newspapers from the late 19th and early 20th century from across the country and Puerto Rico are available for free, working with our partner at the Library of Congress. In addition to awarding these and many other grants, we also think it's important to honor individuals and groups whose work has deepened this nation's understanding of the humanities and broadened our citizens' engagement with history, literature, languages, philosophy, and other humanities subjects. We do this through the awarding of the National Humanities Medals. These medalists are chosen by the White House in consultation with the NEH and presented by the President in conjunction with the National Medals of the Arts at an annual White House ceremony. Since 1996, when the first National Humanities Medals were given, there have been 175 medals awarded, both to individuals and organizations. Past medalists include Pulitzer Prize winners Philip Roth, Annie Dillard, Jhumpa Lahari, and Larry McMurtry, essayist Joan Didion, Nobel Peace Prize laureate Elie Wiesel, sociologist Robert Coles, poet John Ashbery, and filmmaker Steven Spielberg. Finally, I would mention our Jefferson Lecture Program. The Jefferson Lectureship was established in 1972, created by NEH to honor the intellectual and civic achievements exemplified by Thomas Jefferson, our nation's third president. This lecture is free and open to the public and exemplifies the values of NEH's founding, which is so still true today. Past Jefferson lecturers have included authors Toni Morrison, Tom Wolfe, and John Updike, historian David McCullough, playwright Arthur Miller, cultural scholar Henry Louis Gates, literary critic Helen Vendler, filmmaker Martin Scorsese, and actress and playwright Anna Devere Smith. 
In addition to these many examples that I've mentioned already, NEH actually dedicates the largest single percentage of its budget to the support of more than 50 state and territory humanities councils, such as the Michigan Humanities Council, of which you just heard in that video. These state councils are independent tax-exempt organizations with dedicated staff members, board members, and volunteers who work tirelessly to create and maintain humanities programming that speaks to the needs of their local communities. In Michigan's case, this programming includes a variety of activities, such as the Primetime Family Reading Program, a grant to an exhibition currently on display at the Michigan Women's Historical Center and Hall of Fame, and this particular program was funded as part of NEH's Standing Together initiative, which seeks to promote understanding of military experience and to support returning veterans. The Michigan Humanities Council also sponsors the Great Michigan Read, which for the last five years has had residents across the state engaged in literary discussion of a selected book. And with that, let me now turn to the next 50 years, which begins, from our point of view, with the culminating event of this anniversary celebration year, a symposium presented by the University of Virginia and sponsored by the Mellon Foundation, which will focus on the future of the humanities in all its various visions. This will be held in September of 2016 and will include speakers, workshops, presentations, and discussions, all public events and all web accessible to focus on all the futures we can each and all imagine for the critical role of the humanities in our world for the next 50 years. The public relevance of the humanities has never been more important. The role of an informed citizenry in the life of this country matters significantly and will continue to matter going forward. So many of the pressing issues we face today require the participation of all citizens and are enlightened by bringing the humanities to bear in all our considerations. Whether it is the understanding of the relationships between humans and the natural world, addressing the challenges and opportunities presented by the changing demographics in many American communities, or deepening the public understanding of the meaning of democratic citizenship in the 21st century in relation to our founding principles and values, our political history, and our current circumstances, the role of the humanities has never been more central to who we are and how we will move forward as a nation ensuring equity and access and the continuing strength of our country. As much as this was critically important in 1965, it is every bit as true now and will be in the future. We at the NEH look forward to supporting all of this work as the future unfolds. Thank you very much. American identity. American identity and culture has always celebrated the arts. Over four and a half million Americans work in the arts and cultural industries, contributing 4.3% to the nation's GDP. That was $698 billion in 2012. The National Endowment for the Arts is America's chief funder and supporter of the arts. As an independent federal agency, the NEA celebrates the arts as a national priority critical to America's future and is investing in arts education and local programs to empower students at all levels. More than anything, the arts provide a space for us to create and express. Through grants given to thousands of nonprofits each year, the NEA helps people in communities across America experience the arts and exercise their creativity. From visual arts to digital arts, opera to jazz, film to literature, theater to dance, to folk and traditional arts, healing arts to arts education, music to design, the NEA supports a broad range of America's artistic expression. Every dollar of funding the NEA awards is matched by up to $7 of additional investment. And we've awarded over $5 billion through the years with a historical commitment to keeping the arts a vital part of our nation. 
Art helps us understand and express the world, driving creativity and innovation. And NEA-funded programs help transform communities into lively, beautiful, and resilient places with art at the center. We envision a nation where every American benefits from the arts, and every community celebrates its goals and achievements through the arts, strengthening our creative capacity and America's future. Our next speaker this evening is Bill Ivey, the founding director of the Curb Center for Art, Enterprise, and Public Policy at Vanderbilt University, which is an arts policy re research center with offices in both Nashville and Washington, DC. He also directs the center's Washington-based program for senior government career staff, the Arts Industries Policy Forum, and serves as a senior consultant to Leadership Music, a professional development program serving Nashville's music community. Ivy is a trustee of the Center for American Progress and served as team leader for arts and humanities in the Obama-Biden administration transition team. His book, Arts Inc., How Greed and Neglect Have Destroyed Our Cultural Rights, was published in the summer of 2008. As an aside, I had the good fortune to pick up a copy of Mr. Ivy's book at an, an Americans for the Arts convention. Uh, and for those of you interested in the state of or future of the arts and culture uh, in this country, I can assure you it is a must read. Ivy served as the seventh chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts from May 2008 through September 2001. And following years of controversy and significant reductions in the NEA's funding, Ivy's leadership is widely credited with restoring congressional confidence in the work of the National Endowment for the Arts, which in and of itself deserves a round of applause. Please join me in welcoming Bill Ivy to the stage. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's great to be here tonight. Uh, I thought a lot about what I was going to say. You're a very tough audience, not because you're mean, but because you're so diverse, not necessarily racially diverse, although I'm sure ethnicity is a factor in our audience, but some of you, those of you who are students, were little babies when I was chairman of the NEA. Others here are skilled arts advocates who have worked to advance the cultural life of our, of our nation for years, for decades. Uh, others are faculty members who are expert in American culture. So it was very difficult to think of, of just what to say. I'll try to say something for everybody. It's, it's, it's great to be here in part because I get to see old friends. Kurt Dewhurst and Marsha McDowell have already been mentioned a couple of times. Peggy Plimpton from the NEH and of course Barry Bergey, uh, a colleague from my years at the, at the Arts Endowment. John Barkley from your, old, your own Michigan Council, great arts leader. Sarah Triplett, wife of your mayor and very uh, strong advocate here in the state. So all of these old friends uh, are part of the community that has advanced the arts uh, here in the United States. And it's great to be here in Michigan, not too far from the university I graduated from back in the middle 1960s, the one that came so very, very, very close <laughs> last weekend. I don't hold it against you. But tonight back in Michigan, back here on stage with you, I'm still pretty far from my hometown, Calumet, up in the UP. A village that, as the car drives, is a good 500 miles north and west of East Lansing. Distance can mean difference. When I was young, my family would drive to Detroit for spring vacation, drive overnight, depart that snow cover in Calumet to enjoy the earthy aroma of early spring in the big city. We shopped at J.L. Hudson's, sipped a Werner's ice cream float, visited the big city enclave where Cornish, where Cousin Jack, friends and relatives had settled, where those families had settled, when they sought jobs in Detroit during the Great Depression. And then riding the bus downtown, frankly, we tried not to stare at African-American passengers. They were exotic. 
In the 1950s, Calumet had neither black residents nor black tourist visitors. So distance in Michigan was and is not just geographical, it is also cultural. And metaphorically, the spectrum of culture represented by the ethnic heritage of Finns, Native Americans, Italians, Cornishmen up in Calumet on one hand, the great fine arts traditions of Detroit Symphony and Wonderful Art Institute, Motown and jazz in Detroit on the other, define both, I think, the opportunities and the challenges inherent in connecting the arts with public policy. So during the next few minutes, I'll talk about the National Endowment for the Arts, reflect a bit on the distance traveled over the last half century, and then speculate a bit about what it will take for us to secure a place for art in public policy during the 50 years to come. And that part is particularly addressed to, to students because I'm not going to be around to make the next 50 years happen, but you will. A few quick points, a bit of history. Although members of Congress talked about government and culture as far back as the Eisenhower administration, the plan that became the NEA really was created in the Kennedy years. And then and now, that administration, that Kennedy administration, was the most elite art-oriented administration in, in American history. The Kennedy years represent a kind of culmination, a kind of triumph of what you might call high middle brow culture here in the US. Think about pianist Van Cliburn or abstract painter Jackson Pollock on magazine covers. Pablo Casals in the state dining room in the Kennedy administration. So back then to speak of the arts was automatically to talk about the fine arts, European origin, Jazz kind of worked its way in for artistic, but mostly political reasons. That's another talk I'd like to give sometime. But the challenge facing leaders in foundations and government seemed clear. Make the fine arts more available to the American people. This meant touring, institution building, musicians, poets, dancers, and actors in schools. Point one. Second point is that in the long term, this approach was probably a bit off-center. Ultimately, in the context of America's democracy, in our diverse creative universe, or in Michigan's diverse universe, for that matter, an elite fine arts approach to policy came with a kind of built-in ceiling. And of necessity, the NEA, to, very, to its great credit, and almost from its inception, began to improvise and to innovate and to redirect its resources, at least a little bit. Consider our program this evening. As Barry uh, mentioned, there, there were no National Heritage Fellows in 1965 when the endowment was created. In fact, there was no program in folk arts until the mid-1970s. The notion of the arts and accessibility, the kind of accessibility Beth was talking about, really wasn't in the viewfinder when the endowment was launched. Sculpture in glass was thought of as a craft, off to the side. Poetry could be found in the literature program. In fact, Michigan had a Poets in the Schools uh, program by 1967. But poetry was quiet, not out loud. My third point is that the endowment, despite these challenges, has achieved remarkable things. In 1965, consider this, 1965, there were about 6,500 cultural nonprofits in the US. Today, there are well over 120,000. Further, the arts are today an organized sector of the economy through advocacy groups like Americans for the Arts and Dance USA, the League of American Orchestras, and many state and community advocacy groups working often in concert to invest in and support the dreams of artists and the objectives of arts organizations. Expansion and this kind of organized effort enabled the NEA to become a real hub around which ideas about the arts, public funding, innovative programming could revolve. And as your Michigan experience illustrates, state arts agencies were important from the beginning. But I'll be honest, from the start, relations between the endowment and these agencies exhibited both a high degree of cooperation and a certain amount of tension. 
a percentage of the endowment's budget was always passed directly to the states, 10% at first, then 20%, now a whopping 40%, and that could be the subject of another speech, like the one on jazz. And state councils were helpful in implementing NEA programs on the ground. I remember that my mother, Grace Ivey, uh, an English teacher in Calumet, Michigan, had the benefit of an NEA Arts Council-funded Poets in the Schools visit by a wonderful, wonderful poet and novelist, Jim Harrison, who is both, has both a, an undergraduate degree from Michigan State and a, and a master's degree, Poets in the Schools. Also, back in 67, a long time ago, also state and cities helped incubate some important ideas. The Art Train Project, which was thoroughly embraced by the NEA, was created here in Michigan. But state and city leaders were often justifiably put out when the endowment would make a direct grant to an orchestra or for the commission of public art insist on significant local matching support, and then swoop in for an opening or an unveiling, placing the NEA chairman in the spotlight, pushing the staff and supporters of state and local arts organizations into the background. Consider the 42-ton Alexander Calder sculpture, La Grande Vitesse, installed in downtown Grand Rapids in 1969 paid for in part by a $45,000 grant from the endowment's then brand new public art program, but it was also matched by $83,000 in local funds. Now it's a signature piece to be certain and one that remains a community landmark, but it's also an example of the way our federal agency could, and still does today, take credit, while the city in fact paid most of the bill. So there are tensions. When I became chairman in 1998, I inherited big challenges in the NEA's relationship with Congress. Again, another separate talk. But state, federal relations were also tense. And one of my very first tasks was to get out among the states, the commissions and councils to diffuse some long simmering resentments. So that's the history. Where are we now? Over the NEA's first 50 years, the agency has witnessed and, in fact, has helped create a mature nonprofit community. And the mature cohort of state agencies, those entities that define much of the arts today. It's a remarkable success story. But there are problems. We call them challenges, but there, there are problems. Our nonprofit sector is big, but big can, in some cases, mean overbuilt. In many communities, nonprofits compete almost viciously for limited resources, grants, donations, and for audiences. There are far too many of America's arts organizations today that live hand to mouth, with management's eyes of necessity fixed constantly on the bottom line. Another challenge, the NEA has, after all, never been a true endowment. In fact, it's a small federal agency dependent on annual appropriations. The budgetary generosity of the White House, OMB, the willingness of Congress to vote its support for, to appropriate funding levels as part of the Interior Bill's appropriation process. And as everybody in Michigan who's worked with the Council over the years knows from experience, if you run to, into a tax-cutting administration or legislature, Arts funding can be one of the first things cut. This truth means that for the NEA and for the states, politics really matters. In the early 1990s, nearly one-third of endowment grants went to New York State because that's where the big fine arts organizations were located. And at the same time, a few visual arts grants, I'll mention the names Maplethorpe and Serrano, familiar to the old-timers here, perhaps less so to students, became very controversial. And no surprise, the NEA found itself in political hot water. It underwent a one-third budget cut. And to this day, content, what you fund, and distribution, where you fund it, those two are constant challenges, and it's a cha those are challenges here in Washington and, of course, here in Michigan. 
And despite forays into funding folk festivals and Broadway theater and poetry out loud, the core of agency support still goes to European fine arts. This has been the endowment's orientation from the beginning, uh, and it's uh, from the creation of the NEA. There was simply an assumption that what the nation needed was more classical music, more performing arts centers, more regional theater companies, new and expanded museums, and so on. In the beginning, in the beginning, nobody asked, what is American art? Why is it uniquely important? How do we celebrate art forms that are a special representation of the American experience? And much of our work in the arts and in culture still begs these same questions. So together, we have done an outstanding job at 50. Many in this room have led in this endeavor, done an excellent job of convincing corporate donors, foundations, and government agencies that the arts, as an amenity, can have special value. The arts are useful. Rocco Landsman's slogan as NEA chairman, art works. And I'd like to dwell just a bit as I begin to conclude here on this idea of art and culture as an amenity. An amenity is something that's nice. It's positive, but it's not essential. An amenity is something you get around to when you've solved all of life's real problems. An amenity might be shown to have certain utility. The arts can stimulate economic development. And music education can help kids do better on standardized tests. We have all made these arguments. And they've worked. But I think we've gone about as far as we can go. Because fundamentally, an amenity, even a useful one, is something that can be marginalized or eliminated when budgets get tight or when national security or disease or a soft economy seem to be, demand our full attention. Think of Detroit's Art Institute, at one point really faced with the, with the choice between paintings or pensions. Fortunately, the choice never really had to be made, but it was certainly framed. In some ways, given this truth, it's remarkable that we've been able to grow a mature nonprofit sector in an environment in which creative practice and artistic heritage have never been a first-tier public policy priority. So this is the challenge that points the way toward how we must move ahead in the next half century. We need to reposition, reframe art, creative practice, and cultural heritage, moving it from the amenity category, take it out of amenity, into the list of essential public policy objectives. And this is for the young people here. You're going to have to work on this. Two ideas for reassessing or revaluing re art and cultural vitality. This is a big one. First, I think we're at the end of a century-long infatuation with the idea that a life of purpose in America can be put together through devotion to work commitment to the accumulation of wealth, and the pursuit of happiness through consumption. I think there are plenty of signs that's beginning to wind down. And we know incomes are worse than stagnant. They're actually in decline. <laughs> Occupations that once offered deep satisfaction, immaterial satisfactions, so I think of law, medicine, airline piloting, teaching, today have been eroded by technologies that substitute the clicks on an iPad for insight, knowledge, creativity, and empathy. Work is simply less appealing, not only less rewarding. Our nation in much of the world and much of the world has indulged in a century-long embrace of the idea that work and the pursuit of wealth could produce lives of purpose. We have surrendered to the demands of work, pursued wealth, also consumption, often at the expense of family and relations with our community. The framework supporting this false dream is beginning to crack. Perhaps the truth is that today, when a newly minted college student takes a job at Starbucks, it's not only what you would call a failure to launch. It's a very unfortunate phrase. But instead constitutes a decision, perhaps one that's hard to articulate, a little unconscious, to step aside from an outmoded 20th, 20th century model of career and consumption that simply no longer promises life satisfaction. If I'm right, if our confidence in work and wealth is eroding, what do we do? Do we just despair as a country? Maybe. But I believe the cultural community can offer an alternative, a deepened engagement with cultural heritage and creative practice as a pathway to a life of meaning and purpose. I've written books about cultural rights 
advancing the idea of expressive life, defining culture as something both individual and shared, multidimensional, above all, essential. Expressive life contains cultural heritage, linking, with, linking us with community, tradition from the past. Expressive life is the arena of personal creative practice, activity that, uh, that, that allows us a sense of strong achievement. In short, from a policy perspective, a vibrant expressive life constitutes an affordable, achieve it, achievable pathway to a life of purpose and meaning for all. If our century-old addiction to work and wealth has opened a hole in the soul of our nation, there is an opportunity for cultural vitality to fill that empty space. Embracing the arts, cultural heritage, and creative practice in a new way, not as something we get around to when times are good and money is easy, but as an essential path to a life of purpose and meaning. Now, thinking big is okay. That's my big idea. You may disagree with it. And I've been accused with some justification of always operating up at 30,000 feet. But the real evidence is right in front of us right here tonight. What do Yvonne, Nadim, Craig, Coral show us? Why does access, why does accessibility matter? Yes, they give us art, native crafts, music, sculpture, literature but each is living proof that cultural heritage and creative practice constitute a reservoir of satisfaction, happiness, purpose, and meaning. And I think each one of them demonstrated that to us tonight. We must make the amenity essential if the next 50 years are to be as important to the arts as was the last half century. This will not be easy because to accomplish this transformation, to place a vibrant, expressive life as a critical value at the very center of American public policy at every level of government, we must make our big, true argument while at the very same time we're down in the trenches making certain that we don't run a deficit next year. So tonight we can celebrate 50 years, and I hope we will take up the essential challenge of transforming the character of America's expressive life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. President Luanna K. Simon is a university president who gets it. The argument that Bill Ivey was just articulating, that the arts and humanities are essential, essential to our campus, essential to our community, essential to our country, President Simon gets it. And as the mayor of East Lansing, I'm proud to call her a partner and glad to call her a friend. Unfortunately, President Simon is not able to be with us this evening in person, but she did prepare a video to bring you greetings and to mark this important anniversary. I'm sorry I can't join you tonight to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. I'm sure it's been really wonderful to have an opportunity to experience such inspiring and creative work that's been supported by NEA and NEH. It really is important to give such support to the visionary people who push the boundaries of arts and culture in the communities around us, as well as those who reinterpret more traditional forms to bring new life to them. Being selected to receive NEA and NEH funding, I'm sure becomes an affirming and even life-changing moment. Strong partnerships with state agencies and community support will be necessary for NEA and NEH to be able to continue to support public awareness of Michigan's rich, diverse cultural heritage. Extending that work to promote equal access to the arts and humanities in every community is really essential. MSU was founded to make a difference in the lives of all Michigan citizens by bridging boundaries and engaging individuals and communities, as well as institutions. MSU, the nation's pioneer land-grant institution, strives to deliver the best of Michigan to the world and the best of the world to Michigan. And for the past 50 years, NEA and NEH grants have helped make that happen. By investing in the power of ideas, words, and images, the arts and humanities are a vital force for making a positive impact in the world. 
Let's work together over the next 50 years to build the kind of vibrant community that enriches and empowers the next generation of Michigan citizens. I hope you enjoyed the evening's festivities. Thanks again for supporting the arts and humanities in Michigan. So in truth, our next presenter probably doesn't require any introduction. Uh, Joshua Davis was raised in the folk tradition, the music, the social movement, the land. He writes songs that blend the roots of American music with gritty rock and roll and vintage soul. Davis has gained recognition as an enthusiastic and successful songwriting and guitar instructor and folk historian. And of course, most of you may recognize him as a season finalist from the hit TV show, The Voice. What you may not know is that Josh is especially interested in the way in which music brings individuals and communities together to foster peace and greater understanding. In February of 2012, he traveled to Palestine and Israel with a nonprofit organization called On the Ground to participate as a cultural emissary in the Run Across Palestine, a fundraising ultramarathon to support fair trade farming communities in the West Bank. Josh's greatest honor as a writer came recently when the Michigan Historical Museum recognized his work in Put It On Paper, an exhibit examining the creative process alongside other legendary cultural minds like Ernest Hemingway and Laura Ingalls Wilder. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage Joshua Davis. All right, what a beautiful spot. Um, Woody Guthrie said, uh, I hate a song that makes you think you're not any good. I hate a song that makes you think you're born to lose because you're too old, too young, too fat, too slim, too ugly, too this or too that. I'm out to sing songs to prove to you that this is your world. It's hit you pretty hard. It may have knocked you over a dozen times. But no matter your color, no matter what your size is, no matter how you're built, I'm out to make songs to make you take pride in yourself and in the work that you do. I'm a huge, huge Woody Guthrie fan for a lot of reasons. But Woody focused on community uh, in everything that he did. He focused on the we rather than the I. And that's been a constant stream of what I've tried to do with my career. Um, I am an MSU alum. Uh, I've been making my living in music for almost 20 years, as a, mostly as a performing songwriter, but uh, a lot of other jobs have come with it. Um, it's taken me all around the world. It's given me incredible opportunities like this one to be here with you and with these incredible, incredible speakers, musicians, uh, poets, and artists. Um, I feel honored to be here uh, celebrating the NEA and the NEH um, this evening. A question, the question I guess that I get most from, from young artists is, weren't you that guy on that show? Uh, but, but second to that, is, uh, is, is the question of, of how, how do I build a successful and sustainable career as an artist? And that's, a, that's a, a difficult question. And the only way that I can really answer it is, is to, to, to take it to a personal level, to, to tell uh, young artists what, you know, what I've gone through uh, up to this point. It's always a challenge, there's always new challenges, and what's made it work for me so far. The number one short answer is, is community, is giving my talents to help build a community around me that has given back to me and supported me through my career. It's been the number one thing. There's a lot more to it. You know, a thirst for growth and, and evolution in your art and in your personal life. A really solid, stubborn streak. Uh, uh, an idea of, of, of what you want to do and why you want to do it. Hard work. Um, the ability to, to live on ramen noodles for like weeks at a time. It's really important. And I'm not talking about like the Williamsburg $20 a pop ramen. I'm talking about grocery store ramen. 
glad we had that straight. Um, no, but, but the, you know, the, the main thing for me at least has been about building and growing a community. And that community has come back and, and has, has buoyed me and has supported me through my career. Um, I grew up in a household that was very, very centered on the arts. It was, uh, my mom is a, is a writer, she's a poet. Um, we would go uh, in the summers to, to music festivals, folk festivals, blues festivals, world music festivals, and uh, I remember this, this one time that, that really struck me when I was a very young child. I remember it really clearly. We went to a festival, I was sitting on the ground, it was in between artists, and uh, we were you know, in the audience, a bunch of people, hundreds of people were there, and everybody was talking, everybody was scattered and talking and waiting for the next artist to come on. Finally, I was watching the stage, and, and a, a gentleman, an older gentleman came on the stage and picked up a banjo and sat down in a chair and started singing. And one by one, people stopped talking, and the, the whole audience quieted, quieted down, and it was, it was silent. And then one by one, as he kept singing, people started joining in. And by the end of the song, the entire audience was, was singing along with this gentleman. And I remember watching the smile on his face. He was just beaming. And I remember thinking, this isn't about him. This is about us. And that was Pete Seeger. And it, it struck me, and it's, it stuck with me for my, for my entire, entire career. And it's been, it's been that thing you know, that thing that, that has, has, has built my career, it's not about me, it's about, it's about us. And when I was a little bit older, we continued going to these festivals, and I was, I was 12 and 13, and I just picked up the guitar, and I had an interest in writing songs. And another thing that was, was really amazing was this core ethic of, of folk music in that... Uh, it's, it's the passing the torch. It's the passing the torch to the next generation, making sure that this music doesn't die, making sure it's a living art form. And that, to me, was, was, was so important. As, as a 13-year-old kid, these artists would be on stage, they'd, they'd play their set, and then instead of like being rushed off the stage back to their tour buses or limos or hotel rooms or jacuzzis or whatever, they were going out into the audience, they were shaking hands, they were doing workshops, and a lot of them had the time to talk to a 13-year-old kid who was just picking up the guitar, just learning how to songwrite. Dave Van Ronk, Spider John Corner, Pete Seeger, Joel Mabus, Greg Brown. I got to sit down with these people and they talked to me and taught me and, and told me about what their lives were like. And that has been everything for me, to, to be able to, to, to give back in that way, to, to learn and to teach at the same time with, with the younger generation and make sure this music doesn't die has been a really, really important for me. Later on in my career, I've played the same festivals that I was going to as a kid, which is a wonderful honor, um, and in, you know, gotten myself out there, met these kids that, that are, are working at this, that are wanting to learn, doing these workshops, taking part in this legacy. Um, so my music has taken me all over the world. It's taken me to lots of different places, really interesting places, crazy places. Um, but one of the, one of the, that, that core element of, of passing the torch and of being involved in a community is ne has never left, and it's never let me down. Um, I've been involved in lots of different organizations. It's a big part of what I do. Uh, Earthwork Music is an artist collective here in Michigan that, uh, it's, it's a network of artists um, that's kind of built on reciprocal enthusiasm, people bouncing ideas back and forth. Uh, you're traveling around as a musician, you find a lot of cutthroat communities where people are just trying to get ahead of each other up the ladder. Our community in Michigan is not like that from what I've, from what I've seen, what I've felt, what I've experienced. It's about collaboration over competition and it's pushing a whole thing forward and I feel honored to be involved in that. Uh, working at Michigan State University's Community Music School was a wonderful, wonderful experience. It's an incredible program. Uh, working with organizations up north in, uh, in Traverse City, where I live now, like Seeds and Blackbird Arts, arts education organizations. And a couple years ago, I, um, a couple years ago, I founded, co-founded an organization called Onstage for Kids that works with uh, 
bringing career musicians into schools to partner with uh, school bands, school choirs, school orchestras, and get real music in front of kids K through 12, which I think is so important. A lot of these kids haven't even seen anybody actually play a real instrument in front of them ever. That to me doesn't make any sense at all, uh, growing up where I did. So um, all of these organizations have been, have been wonderful. It's wonderful to, to, to take my time and to, to give to these and to create these networks. Um, one of the more interesting organizations uh, that I've been involved with is, is an organization called On the Ground. On the Ground is, like we heard, is a, an organization that does work with fair trade farming communities all over the world. They gave me a call a couple years ago and they said, we have this idea, we're going to put on an ultra marathon, 129 miles, five days across the West Bank to raise funds and awareness for Palestinian fair trade olive farming communities. I said, there's no way that I'm running a marathon, much less five marathons. They said, no, no, you don't need to run. And I said, also, I'm a Jew. There's no way you're getting me to go to the West Bank. Um, they, were, they were very convincing. Uh, they told me that my job was going to be as a cultural emissary to take these songs and stories that I had here and to take them to the West Bank to work with Israelis and Palestinians uh, and put on these cultural exchanges where we trade stories back and forth, songs back and forth, dancers and community leaders and work to build bridges with music. I said yes and it was one of the most wonderful decisions that I've ever made. I conquered that fear of being a Jew in the West Bank and I took my art there, and I came back with all of these songs. I'm gonna play you a song right now, I'm gonna move over here for a second. It's amazing how they do that. I'm gonna play you a song um, that I wrote uh, based on the experiences I had over there. I, I released an album called A Miracle of Birds uh, that's based on the experiences. Half the proceeds go back to the organization to continue their work all over the world. And uh, it, was a, it was a really delicate situation. If, if you guys don't know, there's a lot of conflict going on over there. I don't know if, I don't know if you guys know that, but, but it, it is the case that's happening. Um, and uh, it was a tough thing to write songs about, so I kept it very personal. Um, I met a, a fellow over there, a Palestinian man uh, named Muhammad Ruzi, who was like the life of the party. He was an incredible guy. And the run went back and forth across the wall between Israel and Palestine and uh, back and forth through checkpoints. Muhammad Ruzi was born in Jerusalem but was pushed out to Ramallah and they, he wasn't allowed back into the, the land of his birth. And one time he stopped me before we were going back into Jerusalem and he said, he said, there was this one time that I saw these two birds flying over the wall and I broke down crying because all I want to do is just go over there for a minute to see where I used to live. And those birds can just do it anytime they want. So I wrote this tune for him. It's called Over the Wall and Gone. We stayed in on the road and watched the cloud the sky. Overhead a pair of birds flew by. Over the wall in the blink of an eye. Over the wall and gone. Walk back down to the turnaround. And I said goodbye. And it didn't make a sound. He just smiled at me and looked back at the ground. But he was over the wall and gone. But two birds are flying, trying to find our way. But two birds are flying. Hope you make it home someday. Well, I, I'm white knuckle in a rocking chair. Up on the roof, I hear the call of prayer. I'm thinking about him and how I never swear. He's over the wall and gone. I want it in the market till the nighttime came. Lost among the whispers of a thousand claims Trying to give the slip to all this shame Sitting over the wall and go 
The streets are waiting six feet down, six feet down. Back down on the ground at JFK, the flight home fell like a ricochet. Whether it's 10,000 miles or a stone's throw away, it's still over the wall and gone. But you birds are flying. Make it home someday. Whoa, whoa. I hope you make it home someday. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for having me here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us tonight to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. You know, uh, I am the newest dean here at uh, Michigan State University, and um, if we're going to bring uh, Bill Ivey's vision of arts and humanities at the center of American cultural life uh, to fruition, we need to begin here at home by bringing an arts and humanities education to the center of uh, the Michigan State uh, experience. And I know so many of you out there have so, uh, supported that for so long, and it's very heartening for me to be here tonight uh, to see uh, all of you and to meet many of you for the first time. Uh, the arts and humanities is uh, a central part of what we're doing at Michigan State University. Uh, it's not only in the College of Arts and Letters, uh, but also in the Residential College for Arts and Humanities led by Steve Esquith, and in Lyman Briggs College led by Elizabeth Simmons, and in the College of Communication and, uh, and Arts uh, and Sciences led by Prabhu David, and in the College of Music led by Jim Fortress. So uh, my colleagues, uh, Dean colleagues, uh, I'm looking forward to working in collaboration with them to make sure that we make uh, the arts and humanities central to uh, the Michigan State experience. And, and to do that, we're going to really need uh, the help of, of everyone in this room. So thank you for being here. 50 years is an impressive milestone for any organization. But more impressive still is the impact of the projects that have been supported, the communities that have been enriched, and the individuals whose lives have been transformed by the work these two organizations were created to inspire and undertake. The NEH and the NEA should be very proud of this legacy. And we celebrate it tonight even as we look forward to the next 50 years in which placing the arts and humanities at the center of American life will enable us not merely to survive, but to create together a more humane, just, and beautiful world. Thank you. Safe travel.